All right. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the 2021 uh, New York State GIS Association Fall Virtual Event and Annual Meeting. Uh, we have some pretty interesting presentations here today I'm very excited about. And uh, I'm going to start off with a keynote address from Paul Rooney and Adam Carnell. We'll start in just a few minutes. Uh, we also have coming up uh, some visits on um, some updates from GISCI and the GISP certification process, followed by a brief update about the latest from the US Census, the 2020 data that's about to drop on us. And then uh, a little bit later on this evening, we'll have the annual meeting where we'll talk about what's been happening with the New York State GIS Association committees and different activities going across the state. And we will also announce our award winners, which will be um, lots of fun and, and sort of an inspiring way to, uh, to end the day. So we will follow all those uh, over the next few hours. And then coming up uh, tomorrow, we have uh, sort of a more somber approach where we'll take a look at the effects of the pandemic on the GIS community. We have uh, some interesting panelists that will talk about uh, their experiences from the government perspective about the pandemic and how it's been affecting, affecting GIS practice, sort of like broadly defined. And then we'll follow that up at four o'clock, uh, four to 6 p.m. Uh, a wonderful collaboration we have with uh, Gizmo of New York City. We'll be talking about the 9-11 uh, events and all of them, lots of panelists that were involved with uh, response to, to this dramatic event that, that occurred, right? So plenty of conversation that'll happen four to six o'clock on, uh, on Wednesday. And just a reminder that uh, this is the, the channel, the Zoom channel we'll be using for this day here today on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we have uh, a different Zoom channel and that'll be good for that whole day on Wednesday, right? So today we're here and Wednesday, beyond, uh, it's like change, changing the channel. Okay, so um, without further ado, let us go ahead and dive into our keynote address. So I wanted to uh, personally take a moment to thank uh, our sponsor, for this event. The folks at Esri have been so generous and with their time and expertise and enthusiasm for this event. It's, it's really been a great help. And I'm, I'm really thrilled at their participation. Uh, being a keynote speaker here today, uh, over the, the last few years of, of GeoCon and our, and our summit, routinely, New York State GIS Association members want to hear the latest what's, with, with what's happening from Esri. And that's what we have here today. So I had a great chat with, with Paul about, you know, the types of things that our, our community wants to hear about. And I think that he's going to provide that here today. And I look forward to uh, everything he's got to say. And I'm also thrilled to, uh, to have Adam uh, from the North Carolina office sort of the GIS evangelist uh, talking with us uh, here today as well. And um, if folks don't know Paul, Paul, Paul Rooney is uh, a longtime New York State GIS person, uh, just a great uh, uh, contributor to the GIS community. Um, you know, lots of expertise with local government issues. And, you know, I think that'll be on point uh, here today. Adam, Adam is uh, from the North Carolina office, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, sort of a GIS evangelist, broadly on, uh, on all the socials, you know, we see him on LinkedIn and uh, lot, lots of great content here today. So thanks again so much to Esri uh, and Paul and Adam uh, in particular. So guys, uh, having said that, um, what we're going to do is uh, they'll, they'll do their presentation, and I think we'll, we'll leave questions at the end. 
So if folks want to uh, either raise their hand or if you want to put a, a question directly into the chat box, uh, I recommend that you do that. And I will monitor the chat for questions that come along and I will raise them at the appropriate time. So having said that, Adam, please take it away. And Paul. Great. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Everybody see my screen okay? Yep. Looks great. Good. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be to support your community and your event. I'm a big uh, New York State fan. My family comes from New York. I, I love New York. I'm coming to you live from Charlotte, North Carolina, though. Um, and, I, you know, I'm really excited. This is the debut presentation of this presentation. So I'm really excited to see what you guys think about this. So we're going to be talking about how important the alignment of location is to your business, what it is, why it's important, and how to do it. And then again, as Chris mentioned, um, Adam Carnow, community evangelist here out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And with me, hopefully you guys know Paul Rooney. Um, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thanks, Adam. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to everybody at the association. I was looking through the participant list here and uh, my college grad school roommate, office mate, Ann Deacon is on the list. I need Eileen Allen, a bunch of folks who I've known for a long time. And that's part of this story that we're going to we're going to talk to you about today. But I really do want to thank the association for the opportunity to spend some time with you guys this afternoon. It may be a bit of a different kind of discussion, but we hope that it will be valuable to you. It is something that is very much on my mind and it has to do with organizational transformation. Um, before we jump into that, um, a tip of the cap for the event coming up tomorrow as far as the 9-11 the, the memorial and kind of a revisiting of the activities that went into the response to that event and how it really shaped in a very, very profound way the world that we live in, obviously, but the world that we live in specifically as um, GIS folks, as location-based professionals. It was uh, a remarkable time um, uh, and, it, and it spurred some remarkable transformations itself. Um, one that we're gonna talk a little bit about today is similarly transformative but without the, the, the challenging context of uh, such an event. But either, either way, I hope, hope you will enjoy the, uh, the discussion here today. And Adam, if you would uh, please advance the slide. So 30 years ago, I was in my first real GIS job at the State Parks Management and Research Institute in Saratoga Springs. I was a youngish analyst learning how to navigate uh, a complex technology as well as the public sector. Um, that's a, a task into of itself. While I was there, I worked for Larry Spraker. Many of you guys know Larry, a terrific guy, taught me a lot about GIS. And, and we served a number of customers coming in who were relying on largely Larry's expertise and my grunt labor. So it was a good combination of things. We met a bunch, I met a bunch of great folks who are still close friends, colleagues, and collaborators. It's been a wonderful career, and I've been able to watch these new facets of our work evolve. And I've been at Esri, as many as you know, for much of that time. So I've had a great seat at the table to watch and learn from all of you. The discussion today, however, is not about technology, but it's about our way of looking at the world, how we think about it that way, how we value that perspective, how we support it, promote it and how we'll need to act to best fit it into our futures. So today, we'd like to talk about you, those of you who built these enterprise systems and are getting ready to retire, those of you who are pursuing opportunities to take these systems forward to a new level and may be wondering how to do so, and those of you who may be new to this world are wondering how to make your mark in some unique times. So Adam, could you go to the next slide, please? First, a little bit of context, please. This data is from the website GovSense, dating back to 2020, and it captures one of the key challenges that we face as government employees or as the businesses who serve and collaborate with government customers. The public sector workforce has a math problem and efforts to address it 
will span all of the different business processes that make up government, including GIS. So the transformation of government, which we've been hearing so much about and which is extremely important, will also be highly competitive. Every government department will be trying to figure out how to attract more talented people and make their work rev relevant, rather. Adam, next slide, please. For the GIS community to grow and to realize its even greater potential, we'll need to step outside of our comfort zone. We'll need to think of ourselves differently, brand our capabilities in more beneficial ways and in using language that will be easier for folks to understand. We'll need to make certain that the knowledge that is about to retire with the folks who hold it is captured before they go. We're going to have to train our current colleagues as well as our next generation of potential practitioners in new technologies and new ways of aligning themselves with our business. And we're going to need to realize that our community must look different and act different so as to broaden our impact. We need to broaden our vision. Next slide, speed down. So New York has a long history of effective GIS usage at all levels of government. As technologies have evolved, many of you have sought out new ways to improve decision-making, visualize problems and solutions, collaborate with partner organizations, educate the public, and most importantly, align with the business needs of your organizations. It's been a pleasure watching your work evolve with the technologies and watch your ability to share so much of what you do with a public who is in need to be informed more so. So Adam, next slide, please. So groups like the New York State GIS Association can and do play an important role in transformation. At the end of the session, will highlight some of the resources you've already begun collecting here, like this survey on emerging GIS needs. These and resources like them can help you make a difference in your organization. You need to understand that they're available and then go about using them. For now though, I'd like to turn this back to Adam so he can lead us through what we feel is the central aspect of successful GIS transformation now and going forward into the next 10 years or so, that's the alignment of location with the business of government. And he'll use for us an example from his home region in North Carolina. Adam? Great, thanks, Paul. So again, the, the central theme here is to make sure that uh, our work is aligned with the business. And so I just wanna clarify, you know, definition of align, we've got it in verb and in transitive verb to bring in a line to array on the side of or against a party or cause to get or fall into line to be in or come into precise alignment or correct relative position. And some synonyms here, these, you know, another way to be aligned is to be coordinated, to be unified or united, to collaborate, to cooperate, to have teamwork, to work together in harmony. But I think for the people that are at the top of the organizations that we work for, what they really hope is that everybody is working together towards a common goal. You know, work is hard. There's organizations out there trying to do really hard things. And in order to accomplish them, it's gonna take everybody on the same page working together. And that is critical if you're gonna be successful with your enterprise GIS. So that's really the focus of our talk today. So let's start out with, in this context, what is alignment to your business and why is it important? Well, there's really easy way to show this in a very practical um, method. And that's to just, I'm gonna walk you through four circles. And this comes from uh, Esri's geospatial strategy best practice. And that is in order to uh, be the most, bring the most value to your organization, which when it comes down to it, that's what we are supposed to do as GIS professionals. We're supposed to deliver value. Uh, we're supposed to digitally transform the organization by making it work smarter and work better. So we start off with the business goals. What are the goals of your organization? These can be in a strategic plan. They can be 
in documents, they can be in annual goals in your you know, employee review system by HR, whatever it is. Every business has some goals. So the first thing we need to do is understand what those goals are and then follow up with whoever is in charge of meeting those goals. And we need to talk to them and learn what their challenges are. Why are they, what, what speed bumps are they running into in trying to meet those goals? Or why can't they meet the goals? What's, what's the problem? How can we help mitigate those challenges? So we need to talk to the people that are in charge of meeting those goals and understand their, their challenges. Then once we understand their challenges, we simply propose business-driven GIS solutions that help mitigate those challenges and get them closer to reaching those goals. If we do that, we have alignment, but guess what? We also deliver business value of GIS. And what this comes down to is resources. I'm sure all of you are very busy and could all use more resources, whether it's staff, hardware, software, training, events, uh, more, more of a salary, et cetera. The only way you're gonna get those additional resources is to personally affect the people at the top that control those resources by getting them to personally experience the benefits of GIS by helping them reach their goals and do their job better. So let's see what this looks like in practice. I'm gonna introduce you to Cabarrus County, North Carolina. So hopefully you recognize the map in North Carolina, the yellow circle is around Cabarrus County. I live in Charlotte, which is in Mecklenburg County to the southwest of Cabarrus. So Cabarrus uh, has a population of about 215,000. They're primarily a bedroom community of Charlotte, but they have a lot going on um, on their own. And they're really striving to you know, emerge from the, the shadow that, that is Charlotte. And they're part of the Charlotte MSA. But let's look a little bit closer about why they're successful with this alignment. Well, first of all, here's their, their website. It looks like um, just about every other city or county website out there. Uh, one of the interesting things I found on there when I was poking around is that, you know, this county is credited with being one of the first in the nation to provide GIS mapping via the internet. So what's very important to understand here is that at Cabarrus County, they have a culture of innovation. They have a culture of supporting GIS initiatives. Uh, and maybe being a little bit ahead of the rest of the crowd, which is great. Uh, and they're consistently ranked um, in the top 10 counties for the use of digital government for the past nine years. Uh, and let me just show you some of these uh, awards. So every year, the Center for Digital Government through GovTech Magazine uh, highlights the digital county survey, and they pick the winners based in brackets by population. So Cabarrus won in 2019 and 2020. They also won in 2021. Um, they won eight awards this year from the National Association of Counties. They won four last year from other um, organizations as well. But what's really interesting is to look at the description of why they won uh, this year. So they won in the category, again, they have it bracketed by population. So they're in the 150,000 to 250,000 population category. There's the short description of why they were selected as a winner from Government Technology Magazine. And lo and behold, what is in here, but alignment, alignment, and align. So uh, the reason why they're getting some respect from the community and consistently finishing at the top is because of they're so well aligned to the business. So the IT organization is consistently providing value to the organization on the things that the organization is concerned with. And that's what it's all about. And I know we've heard, uh, we've probably all heard this quote, teamwork makes the dream work. But I actually, until I researched it, didn't know the second half of this, which is really key, which is, but a vision becomes a nightmare when the leader has a big dream and a bad team. So it takes an entire team to deliver, consistently deliver such results like Cabarrus is doing. And so let's reach back again to the ESRI geospatial strategy best practice. And one of the first things you need to do uh, in your geospatial stat strategy is to assemble your team. And the three critical roles that need to be on your team are champion, technical leadership, and executive sponsor. So if you are the GIS manager or leader of GIS in your organization, you are the champion. You are the person whose primary goal it is, is to drive the adoption of the technology throughout, throughout the organization to make a difference. Uh, since GIS is a, a technology, we want to make sure that we've got the support of our technical leadership. So that's your IT director, your CIO, CTO, whatever it had must be. Uh, 
we need to make sure that they understand the potential and the value of GIS and we'll support you in getting more resources and we'll make sure that you're following their best practices and that our plans align with their plans as well. So we wanna definitely make sure that you've got your IT director uh, on board and as, as a firm supporter of GIS. And then m one of the most important things is you need to be not only one executive sponsor, but you need sponsors. Uh, you've got to tend a garden to grow as many executive sponsors as possible. The reason you don't want just one is because if you hook your wagon to one horse and then that horse leaves the organization, you're back to square one. So we need to constantly be looking at executives and making sure they're understanding the value and will support GIS um, throughout the organization. And again, we can do that by providing value to them, personal experience value by helping them meet their goals and mitigate their challenges. And that's what this alignment is all about. So let's look at what that looks like at Cabarrus County. So first of all, the executive sponsor is Debbie Brannon. She's the area manager of innovation. She's an executive that wields a lot of uh, influence in the, in the county. And she's a huge supporter and fan of GIS. And uh, it couldn't happen without her great leadership and the doors that she opens for us. Uh, the technical leadership is Todd Shanley. He's the CIO there at the county. And we really have kind of... Uh, maybe a, a mole or a spy, an embedded spy here with Todd. They're in a great um, position because lo and behold, Todd has been at the county for over 23 years and he started as a GIS intern at the county. So we have a former GIS professional and GIS, well, he would say he's still a GIS professional and former GIS manager that's elevated himself to C CIO. So that is just huge in the fact that you've got a CIO that it just comes out of our industry and, and just understands it from the get-go. And then lastly, but certainly not least, the man that makes it happen is Joe Battinelli. And what I'd like to point out here real quickly is look at Joe's uh, title. His job title is not GIS manager. It is business and location innovative services supervisor. So that right there tells you exactly what Joe is focused on. He's focused on providing business and location innovative services to help people in the, um, in the organization get stuff done. And that's the title of his department as well. And when I talked to Joe to run by him this presentation, you know, he just wanted to let me know he just hired a new GIS analyst. And what this GIS analyst new job is full time is to simply build relationships with the departments so that they can help ID opportunities for GIS projects. He also said he's got two GIS staffers that are getting their master's degree in GIS. And lo and behold, they're doing their final projects on projects for the cities and county. So they're providing mutual benefits to the employees as well as to the organization. So really great team there that are, are making the dream work. So how do you align your GIS to your business? Let's go back to those four circles, business goals, business challenges, business-driven GIS solutions gives us business value and equals alignment. So let's look at the goals. So if you go to the Cabarrus County um, website, you can find their strategic plan. This is not the GIS strategic plan. This is the strategic plan for the county. You'll find the mission and the vision. Then you'll find individual goals uh, with uh, associated objectives, and they're uh, broken out by category. This one's on healthy and safe communities. The next one's on culture and recreation. Uh, and then it goes on to sustainable growth and development, and then a thriving economy. So, and then lastly, transparent and accountable government. So these aren't anything unique. You'll find a lot of these at similar cities and counties across the country. But what's key here is that we understand what these are, who's in charge of meeting them so that we can drive um, the rest of this process of alignment. So now let's talk about, now that we know the goals, let's talk about, you know, finding out what these challenges are. So, Here's a, uh, a snapshot of me presenting to county leadership uh, before we came in to interview each department and learn their challenges. And so what this was here to do was to let the leadership understand, number one, the potential of the GIS, the benefit and the potential of the technology to help the organization mitigate their challenges and meet their goals, but to get them really interested and fired up to participate in this process and not just to say, why are these people wanting to talk to me? I don't have time for this or whatever. So we did a full disclosure as to why we were there to help them and we needed to understand their business as best as possible. And that way we get there really bought into the process and it was really successful. We had some directors come up to us 
and ask us to double the amount of time that we were going to meet with them because now that they understand the impact of this, they've got a lot to talk about because you know most of the everything a county or a city does, you know, is spatial. So this was a critical part of um, you know getting to know what those challenges were by first engaging the leadership and make sure that they got their their staff that you know gainfully participate you know in the in the process. So next we're going to. Now that we know the challenges, we're going to look for business-driven GIS solutions that we can implement, you know, in a sustainable manner across the organization. And this means not writing custom apps. It's not sustainable because if you do custom apps, pretty soon all you're doing is trying to keep them up and running. So we want to do this as sustainable as possible. So if you're an Esri customer, hopefully you're aware of our ArcGIS solutions group. Um, this is a whole slew of, of applications that are put together when you know after we hear the challenges from real cities and counties and agencies across the country and then develop these working with them and their workflows and their data so these are real world solutions there's over 100 100 of them um, they're free they're open source they're supported they're constantly updated you can deploy them in the cloud without any infrastructure or software um, etc so it's a really valuable place to go this is your app store so go here First, find the app that you can deploy to meet that challenge and move on your way. And then you've got a very low total cost of ownership. You also want to always make sure that you get any training related to project work. So you don't want to learn while you're doing it. So you want to make sure that whatever techniques are needed to successfully deploy some technology, that you've got those skills uh, ahead of time. So definitely you know, build into some training into your process. And nobody runs a successful enterprise GIS um, on, their, on their own. Everybody gets help. So you can get consulting help from Esri or, or, or our partners or other folks out there. And then our partners also have their solutions available via the ArcGIS marketplace. So what I'm trying to do is explain some best practices here that you need to get help, you need to you know, dial up some training, uh, and you need to make sure that you're doing this in a sustainable way. So what does this look like when we're done? Well, this is the um, GIS app library from the Cabarrus County website. So these are a bunch of the public, uh, publicly accessible apps that they've embedded uh, into their work and made available to the public to help address some of their challenges that they're meeting. But then when I talked to Joe, he wanted me to highlight a couple of apps that are very important. Number one is this one, which is emergency rental assistance. So this is the um, e economic stimulation package coming from the feds that's come down to Cabarrus County. They've got over $10 million to distribute out to help people meet their rent uh, during this hard pandemic time. And while this is not a GIS application, what this does show is how Joe and his group are providing enterprise IT services. So this app uses their address validation service so that when people put in an address to get some rental assistance, it double checks and makes sure that it is a valid address and they are within the county and they are eligible uh, for the assistance. This next app does have a GIS piece to it. This is their foreclosure app. So another economically driven app that's very important to the people at the top of the county to make sure they're on top of the foreclosure issue and they know where they are and which properties they are and they can help them through the process. Uh, they've deployed some applications directly in response to the pandemic. This is their impact planning report that shows the effects of the pandemic on various demographics and um, and, and different issues uh, across the county. So uh, really well done. And this is, this is put out there to the public. Uh, another app that, that's of interest is this app, which shows Narcan deployment. Um, it's a heat map of Narcan deployment events over time. So Narcan is uh, administered when somebody is having a drug overdose by usually an EMT on site. And so by mapping where Narcan has been deployed, you're seeing where overdoses are happening, happening across the county. What I really like about this app is it shows how this data is changing over time. I think a lot of us have data with a timestamp on it, but quite often we don't utilize that because if you're gonna be attacking the opioid um, epidemic in the county, I need to know where the overdoses are happening now, not where they happened a year or two ago, uh, this is obviously changing over time, and we need to make sure we focus our resources in the right places at the right time. Uh, another app to highlight is this biodiversity dashboard, another important part of uh, what the people at the top are concerned about in uh, Cabarrus County is making sure that the natural resources of the area stay intact. So this shows observations 
of species of concern, both plant and animal across the county. And you can interrogate it and look at different species and see where they were um, seen, et cetera. So I've never seen that at the local government level. I think that, that's a pretty interesting application. So as this comes together, we just walked through an example of how Cabarrus County you know, addresses, looks at the goals, talks to the people in charge of those goals, learns the challenges, delivers business-driven GIS solutions in a sustainable manner that follow best practices, and therefore they get alignment and are delivering business value of GIS. Now, the next thing I wanna show you here is what we call here at Esri the solution map. And that is, um, this is an, again, a best practice that we use to communicate um, why a GIS solution should be applied to a certain problem. And so I've found in the past that a lot of GIS professionals have difficulty in effectively presenting their case to an executive asking for sponsorship for their project. And so this is just something that we've come up with that we use and we've found it really effective and I wanted to share it with you. And we call it the solution map. And what this shows is you really should be able to quickly um, describe the reason why you need the resources in a very simple, quick manner. Uh, executives don't have a lot of time. They're usually not interested in a lot of details, especially technical details. And so this will get you in and out, out of there pretty quickly by giving them the key information they need. So the first slide is all about the problem. And the example I'll use is a Federal Highway Administration mandate from a few years ago that stated that public agencies have to establish and implement a method to maintain traffic sign re retro reflectivity. That's, we wanna make sure our signs are visible at night. And the, real, the cause of that problem is that the nighttime crash rate is three times the daytime crash rate. And so improving sign visibility helps everybody. So what's the negative business impact to my organization if we were to not meet the mandate? Well, if that was to happen, that would lead to reduced sign visibility over time that we would be unaware of which would lead to an increased potential of crashes, which will lead to increased liability. Now, increased liability is a great phrase to use because if you're in a meeting with an executive trying to get their support and they hear that, they're going to put their phone down and they're going to pay attention because the last thing they want is increased liability. So it's really important to make sure you're talking with pointed language that's going to get their attention. So the second slide is simply the solution. How we're going to solve that problem? We're gonna implement a GIS-based sign inventory and management system. We're gonna follow best practices. That means configure first or look for something off the shelf rather than coding, up, coding it up uh, on our own. And what will be the positive business outcome? We'll fully comply with the mandate. We'll get improved sign visibility, which should lead to reduced cra crashes and should lead to limited liability, a great phrase that they wanna hear. But along the way, we'll get other benefits. We're gonna get increased efficiencies because we'll know exactly where our signs are and what kind of signs they are and when they were put up and what their reflectivity is and when they need to be replaced. And we'll be able to schedule that. We'll be able to make sure we have all of the supplies in place. We could even most efficiently route the crews out there to replace the signs, et cetera. So we're gonna get more benefits than just the meeting the mandate and improving the visibility of the signs. And then the last thing you need to deliver is just the schedule and the cost. And here we just need to give a simplified schedule. And again, we wanna make sure that our cost is a TCO, total cost of ownership. You don't want to ever come back and ask for more money or you don't want them to find out after the fact the bill was bigger than they thought. So we want to include hardware. We want to include software. We want to include in any workforce development or training uh, involved. We want to include change management. Not a lot of people think about that. We're always worried about getting the tech ready for the organization. You've also got to get the organization ready for the tech because you can deploy the best technology there is, if people don't adopt it and actually use it, it's not providing any value. So we wanna make sure we address change management and people understand why we're deploying this technology and why they need to use it and the benefits it will provide. And then also, we probably we're gonna need some external assistance. Who's that gonna be? So we wrap all of that together. And that's our total cost of ownership that we would present. And that's it, two slides, six boxes, ask for some questions. Hopefully you can be in and out of there in 20 minutes. So that's really a, a great, I think, best practice way to present uh, a GIS solution for sponsorship in a, in, a, in a really directed manner. Okay, so now it's time to go over some resources and I'll kick it back to Paul for this. Thanks, Adam. Um, before we even get going, I just wanted to reiterate one point coming out of that presentation, maybe two points. Uh, number one is that the process that Adam described here is all about people, right? 
we'd be thrilled if what you're pursuing involves Esri technology. But the importance here is however you're using GIS and whatever flavor of it you may choose, be choosing to do, understanding and aligning the needs of your decision makers in business around the use of your technology, getting your staff trained on the tools that you need to maintain that environment and to identify those business opportunities. Those are going to be key decisions for you folks going forward into the, the coming years and the evolution of your systems. I, I did want to spend a couple of minutes, and Adam, if you jump to the next slide, please. The, the, the association has already started placing resources at your disposal. And I will credit you guys for that effort. I, re, I mentioned some of the interviews that had been conducted with state and county, state county municipal leaders at the beginning. I would encourage, you, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And in addition, we'll talk about it and a return on investment piece. So Adam, if you could just jump forward one more, please. There is in your, uh, on, on the state site and on the association site, interviews, as I mentioned, with your local government leaders. And I wanted to pick out a couple of things, particularly from the emerging GIS uh, findings that I think will be important. And they have to do with stumbling blocks and they get to an understanding and an insufficiency of resources. That get, and all of that gets back to what Adam was talking about before with how are you educating the decision makers, the language that you're using to affect best understanding. And then if you're going to bat for resources to implement applications, to build out your infrastructure, you need to realize again that you are competing with other uh, departments within your own organization. So hopefully the approach that had been laid out here addresses some of those important aspects that you're going to need in order to best promote the value that your organization brings. Now, this, uh, this survey goes back a couple of years, and there was an important aspect here mentioned between county and municipal GIS. And uh, having seen many of the counties evolve in their role of supporting municipalities, that's been an important step during the history of GIS in the state. Now, what I can happily say is that between what Esri's done and what other vendors have done in this market, WebGIS has changed what a lot of you are able to achieve. Now you can achieve that with or without collaboration. I would really like to encourage you to collaborate. The technology has never been better suited to do so and the value that other organizations can provide in making access to authoritative services, and sharing workflows and sharing responsibilities in workflows that are collaborative across organizations and in helping tell stories that are important to multiple organizations. All of that has changed considerably and it's a great opportunity now. So collaborate in every opportunity and hold your vendors accountable. Make certain that folks like us are aware of what your needs are, how those needs ought to be reflected in the technologies that we provide to you and in the enhancements that we make to our technologies as we go. So Adam, could you jump to the next one, please? Adam talked a, a quite a bit about uh, total cost of ownership. And I wanted to acknowledge a resource that is on the association site called the GIS Calc. And it had been driven uh, through some funding from um, the, um, I think it was the Society for New York City. And if I get that citation wrong, I apologize. The importance of this is that it is a spreadsheet template that has some pretty advanced analytics that lead you to a cost benefit value based on a number of different factors. There's instructions on how you can proceed. There are ways of capturing the unique information about your organization and then processing that into numbers that can be very valuable for you to share back with your decision makers in your community. So tap into these sorts of resources. This is terrific. We took a long look at this the other day. I think it's very valuable. And we hear a lot about ROI as a topic. 
You guys have this available to you right now through some of the really good work already been done by the organization. So congratulations for that. Take advantage of those sorts of resources. So uh, Adam, I think I can go back to you now. Yep, yeah, I'll take it from here, Paul. So on that ROI statement, um, the next piece of this is if you're delivering value, you've got to get credit for it because as Paul mentioned, it's a competition for resources in your organization. And so your fellow departments are your competitors. And so there's a best practice now that you've really got to calculate the value you're delivering and not everything can be not the value. Of everything cannot be always be done by we saved X dollars or X people time per hour or X um, dollars and cents. But we need to do as best a job as we can with every GIS project on documenting that value. And then we've got to publicize it because you've got to be recognized for the value that you're delivering so that you get the resources you deserve. And so I recently did a webinar on this called Communicating the Value of GIS in Your Organization, How to Measure Return on Investment. When you get the slides, if you click on this slide, it will take you directly to that website where you can watch a video of it, you can download the slides, and there's a whole lot of other resources. But this is a key best practice. You've got to calculate the value that you're delivering, and then you've got to publicize it both within and external to your organization. Some other resources I'd like to direct you to. Uh, this handout is uh, available at this URL. This is all about the beginning of uh, understanding a geospatial strategy. And the number one most important thing, element of a successful enterprise GIS is a strategy. And from my research of over 800 GIS professionals across the US, I know that the majority of uh, organizations using GIS do not have a geospatial strategy. So if you don't have a geospatial strategy, you need to um, get one going. And this is your first step towards that. If you're an Esri customer, I would like to reach out to your account team. We can help you with that as well. I'd also like to direct you to this wonderful book that comes to us from Esri Canada called Geospatial Strategy Essentials for Managers. Matt Lewin is a top-notch member of our community, uh, does a lot of uh, um, content creation around uh, strategic uh, business of GIS. So definitely check the, his book out. It's an ebook available to you free online. Also, if you're in the government space, a really great website and book is called Smarter Government. It's focused on the work of uh, former uh, Maryland governor and Baltimore mayor, Martin O'Malley. Uh, he is a big believer in the use of technology to create smarter government. And this website has lots of information and lots of stories and examples of how you can communicate to an executive in your organization the value of technology on your organization. And there's a companion book. So if you want to buy the book for your uh, executive sponsor, that's a great way to get them to start to understand the value of technology. Another great resources, uh, resource if your government agency is this Data Smart City Solutions site. And this comes to us from the Harvard Kennedy School, their Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Again, another uh, slew of best practices and case studies and success stories and examples of how best to use technology to make a government entity uh, smarter. Uh, and that's run by Stephen Goldsmith, who's a former um, uh, vice mayor of New York. And then lastly, I'd like to highlight some of the peers out there in the GIS community that are really, uh, that are do, putting out a lot of great content on this business strategic side of GIS. And I'm not highlighting these people because they work for Esri distributors. These I believe are the top people no matter who they work for. Uh, Nathan is out of New Zealand. Matt, as I mentioned earlier, out of Canada, he wrote that book. And then also Paul, Paul Sinot out of Esri Ireland. So follow these people on social media and on LinkedIn and check out their content. It is top notch and will help you navigate the uh, business side of, of GIS in your organization. Uh, lastly, I'm going to turn this back over to Paul. We're going to get to the conclusion here in the call to action. Thanks, Adam. All right, if you could just advance one, please. So th the takeaways out of all this for me um, are sharing your successes and your failures. Uh, share them with each other. Use the resources that the association is providing and contribute to them. Make requirements of them or make requests of them to keep those current. That's a challenge for everybody, but it is, uh, it's valuable if we think about the total effect on a community. So if you go about and use that GIS Calco ROI tool, share what you learned, share, share the result of it uh, that you filled out. 
help each other and lift each other up. This has been uh, an historic aspect to the New York State GIS community. There's always been great collaboration. Uh, there's been the recognition that the work that we do is meaningful and that the work that we do can be challenging. And it's certainly that way now, right? But there are great opportunities available to us now, right? And to this community. And, and hopefully what we've tapped today is some of that sense of how your actions as individuals within your organizations can couple with the, the advances of the technologies that Esri and others like us are bringing to you, right? So the uh, we Adam and I were talking about what are the what are some of the things that you guys can be doing further to assist yourselves is update that survey of GIS managers for those top five issues. You've got a great precedent already there. Make it current. Talk about those issues impacting your public center uh, public sector successes and failures and align them with the New York State Geospatial Council, uh, the Advisory Council. That's an important element in collaboration. We haven't really talked about the role that the state plays in here, but when you think about what they develop as far as core services that are key to a lot of the work that we do, both mapping and geoprocessing services, those folks value the interaction from the local government and the county governments in the state. Align your efforts as an association with the work that they are doing and get them working more for you. So, Adam. All right, thanks, Paul. So here's your roadmap to alignment. Find out what those goals are. Talk to the people in charge of meeting those goals. Find out what their challenges are. Deliver sustainable business-driven GIS solutions that follow best practices and you'll get business value GIS. Now you need to document that value and you need to publicize that value. So that's the last part of that, that piece is, is celebrating your success and making sure others know about it so that you get the resources that you deserve. And as Paul mentioned, this is all about the people. The technology part is the easy part. It's the people part that's the hard part. And so you've got to dedicate time and energy working on this stuff. You've got to proactively go out there and talk to executives and engage with them and learn what their pain is, learn what their vision is, and then come back and propose GIS solutions to them that help mitigate their pain and get them closer to their vision. If you do that, you'll get more resources, you'll get more cachet, you'll get more um, power in the organization. Uh, your, your, your professional development will be increased. Now, I know this is might be uncomfortable for you, so I'm going to channel my best Ted Lasso here. Hey, taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse. If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. And Ted's right, because I deal with executives all the time, and it's not always comfortable. But you know what? Those are the most important meetings that we have. Uh, and so, we, you know, your, your colleagues and the executives in your organization want your help and need your help. They just don't know it. And so they're waiting for you to walk in there and help them get the job done so that they can look better and accomplish what they're supposed to be accomplishing. So the last thing before we wrap, we wrap this up is we talked about this at the beginning, you know, really what your job is as a, as a geospatial professional is to digitally transform the organization by making it smarter, making it better, making it more efficient, not to do all the GIS work yourself. So get out there, proactively meet with people and make it happen. I don't want this to just be another presentation that you sit through and move on about your day. I wanna inspire you and call you to action to change the way you're doing things, um, create sustainable solutions that deliver value and align with the people at the top. And I guarantee you, you'll be, you and the, the organization and the community will be better for it. That's all we have. Here's our contact information. We'll be happy to I love hearing from customers. Uh, I'd love to connect with you and learn what you're do doing and help tell your stories. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thanks, Adam and Paul. Fantastic. We've got some great, uh, great comments in the chat already. And I wanted to bring up if uh, folks wanted to ask a question or make a comment to Adam or Paul, just to go ahead and, and uh, throw it in the chat. And uh, we have time uh, to have a little conversation. Um, 
while we wait for that to roll in, I, I had a, a question if, um, if I, or more of a comment. And you know, one, one of the things I was thinking about when you're describing uh, Cabarrus County is, is that, uh, you know, sometimes we talk in the GIS world that I'm working in a small county and I don't really have the capacity to uh, make significant changes in, in my work practice. And I, I think what you're talking about really addresses those issues for counties big and small. Um, would you say that's right? Yeah, for sure. In fact, um, there's another great example that I didn't highlight here. And I think I'm going to turn my video off to help with my, uh, with my bandwidth here. Okay. But there's a great example that I didn't highlight here from Bonneville County, Idaho. So Bonneville County, Idaho has a population of about 100,000. And a few years back, they had one GIS professional. And Bonneville County gets hit all the time by wildfires. And in the past, they'd always responded by paper and pencil and manual workflows. And she recognized that one of the most important things that the people at the top cared about was fighting those wildfires. And so she turned to some of the sustainable um, commercial off-the-shelf applications that we um, put out as part of ArcGIS solutions that help fight wildfires. And she worked with us and partners to deploy those. And sure enough, they got hit by wildfires and their response was a new generation and it totally blew away the people at the top. Now we all know how hard it is to get brand new full-time employees approved under a budget, right? Mm -hmm. Well, after that and some other great work that she did within two to three years, they hired five more full-time GIS staff, five at a county of a hundred thousand people. Hmm. You deliver value and they will find the resources, believe me. Right on. Uh, I'll check the, uh, yeah, I, th I think that's right on. Uh, you know, some of the counties in New York can be relatively small, up upstate, of course. And, but, you know, I think the principles here apply to management um, at, at counties big and small, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, so another question that, that pops up to me uh, in, this, in this conversation is, is about management and, and leadership and how, how do we go about learning these skills? I mean, uh, sometimes it's by trial and error, or, or is there something that, that we can do to kind of build up our skill to, to kind of be better at the ROI question and the promotion and how to effectively use resources? Yeah, I, I can address that. Um, so definitely, that's a great point, Chris, is that this stuff doesn't just come naturally, like you've got to work on it, and you got to build these skills. And again, it's usually out of our comfort zone. So there is training out there. And there's leadership training, there's business training, there's IT management training. Um, a, Eurissa has a GIS leadership academy, which lasts a whole week. And that one covers all of what I've talked about and more. And it's done and it's delivered from um, uh, instructors that are from the GIS community. And it's focused on specifically GIS leadership, but you can get generic leadership and management um, training anywhere, LinkedIn, online, all kinds of places. And, you know, a lot of professionals, as they seek to move up, a lot of them go back to get master's in GIS. You know, I have a master's in urban and regional planning. Had I known what I know now, I'd have gone and gotten an MBA or I would have gotten um, a master's in public administration if I was in the public sector, or I would have gotten an, a master's in enterprise IT management. Because if you wanna move up in the business, you need to let go of the tech side of things and you really need to embrace those other skills that are more important to the people that at the top. Yeah, I, I'd add to that too, Chris, the, the sense that you know, we talked about a comfort zone here, and this is challenging. We have, we have, as a community, whether it's in New York, throughout the region with New York, through Eurissa nationwide, um, these resources have not been real prominent, or the need to drive access to these resources has not been real prominent. But now, I, when we go back to the, the nature, the beginning of this conversation, and the competitive nature for resources within the government space. I mean, there's a there's a, a, a fair chunk of dollars that are coming into governments through uh, Recovery Act funds, not to mention other avenues. So the competition for that will require some, some skills to articulate value, 
right? How you get it? Do you go and get it through uh, a class on your own? Does the association consider how to offer up something like that on behalf of its rank and file? Those are those all can be options that I, I, I think you guys should consider. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think that's a fantastic suggestion. Uh, uh, you know, the, the opportunities when, when people are busy working, you know, the opportunities to, to do additional professional development, um, you know, it, it's, you know, we're used to doing that in the, in the technical realm, right? We always got to learn the latest updates and, and uh, additions to software, but, you know, these other skills are probably uh, in some ways perhaps more valuable in, in certain contexts. And well, it, the, the other thing I would say, though, is if you think about it, the other skills are, are very much more common sense and common nature. Hmm. Everybody here has put together a budget. Everybody has to make those decisions about what to go after and not. And everybody has had to make the argument why what they would like to pursue is really of most value, right? Whether it's yeah. your personal family budget or other things that, that you have to consider as expenditures, those are all aspects that we know how to do when pressed. And, and it's, I think historically, this our field has not been one where we've been charged with going out and really promoting ourselves well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's changing, right? And I think it's important that it, that it does because the technology is now becoming much more mainstream. And mm -hmm. Adam got to it before. In Cabarrus County, the, 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 the lead practitioner doesn't have GIS in his title. We ought to all be thinking about how to potentially rebrand the divisions that we have within our organizations away from GIS and into what are we doing as um, a location slash analytics right. slash, you know, spatial uh, department for our the, the, the in service to the rest of our, our group. So, yeah, I mean, real quickly before, because mm -hmm. I know we're running out of time, but I, yeah, I'd add to that and say, you know, I think the elephant in the room is that the average GIS manager job description is based off of 10 to 15 years ago when a GIS department mm -hmm. did all of the GIS work. Meanwhile, the technology has transformed into enterprise IT technology that turns everybody into GIS analysts. And so the job description has changed. It's no longer on the tech side. It's all on pushing the organization forward into digital transformation by expanding the use of the technology strategically throughout the organization. And so that means the skills required to do that job are different. And so most of the GIS managers are out there don't even know that this is what they should be doing. And so it's a self-realization. And then, oh my goodness, how do I get these skills to do this and refocus on what I need to be doing? Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I mean, that, that's well said. And, you know, describing these skills and, and abilities, uh, like you said, the, the, the evolution of the average position has really, really changed quite a bit. And uh, that just the pandemic has really highlighted this issue about, about the numbers, right? You're talking about business administration or public administration. I mean, that makes a lot of sense where you're kind of talking about things from this uh bottom line return on investment perspective and you know that happens in all all levels of of government now and um yeah i, I think that's right on so um okay so we're about at our at our time uh i just wanted to thank paul and and adam for a really inspiring and thought-provoking presentation right I, I really have a lot of uh, great ideas now, and uh, other folks had, had sent that in, also in the chat. And thank you. I, I love the fact that you went through our documentation and <laughs> found all the found all the gems, right? So we got yeah, to go back. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's good stuff. Go check it out, folks. You got right. stuff there that can be great springboards for you. We would love to, if the opportunity or the desire is ever there to have us come back and continue this conversation. We value the opportunity. We'd, we'd love to do so, and. Uh, one, I guess if I were to leave you guys with anything, it's it, it's very selfish. It is very much in my interest, Adam's interest, and Esri's interest as a company to do everything that we can to help you guys be more successful, right? And mm -hmm. as would any other vendor in this position say, I'm also somebody that has been a participant in GIS in New York for a very long time. And I really, it, it gives me a great joy to see it successful. So 
if there are things that we can do to help further your success, please let us know. And in the meantime, we're, we're putting together some further ideas around this topic of transformation that we would like to be able to share back with you. And if that spurs further conversations, we'd be thrilled. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thanks, Paul. And if folks have ideas about that that they want to share, uh, feel free to uh, contact me directly or contact the association at our at our email address or talk with folks at our professional development um, committee where we do workshops, right? I can envision that we can continue the conversation a little bit uh, later in the year with a follow-up event. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, so if, yeah. I could go on and on, but uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. But, it's been uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks to everybody in the association for hosting us. And we look forward to talking again soon. All right. Thanks, thanks so much. So we'll much. talk to you tomorrow for the, uh, for the, for the round table. Yes. Excellent. Very good. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate thanks, it. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. That, that was great. Um, okay. So we're talking about uh, skills and knowledge, skills, and abilities. And that sounds like something that has to do with GISCI. And so now we will uh, see if we can bring in Tony uh, Speechy. And I think we'll, we'll give it about a one, one and a half minute break here while I bring Tony in. So just a few minutes here, folks. Right. Okay, can you hear me? Hey, Tony. How are you? Great, great. How are you? Doing well. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us from uh, while while you're multi conferencing. This is <laughs> it's a new term. Multitasking is now multi conferencing. <laughs> it's been a busy few weeks, to say the very least. Right yeah. on. Right on. So uh, Tony is, is here to uh, speak with us about sort of the, the latest developments with the GISP uh, certification. Uh, and so he'll say, uh, say a little bit and then we'll, I know folks have questions about it. So if, if folks have GISP related questions that you wanna ask uh, Tony or about the exam, uh, feel free to, to let it fly in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, I can also open up folks that want to talk uh, directly uh, if you want to do that. So without further ado, uh, thanks so much to Tony Speechy. He is the new executive director of uh, GISCI, the GIS Certification Institute, and uh, been on the job uh, a few months now. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of, it's probably like drinking from a fire hose, I, I assume. And uh, I also wanted to say that, that Tony is a SUNY graduate. And uh, as a SUNY person myself, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And um, Tony has a, has a long storied career in, in uh, government practice. And um, he's coming to us live from NISJIC, I do believe, and wow. uh, probably his hotel room. So Tony, thank you for being here. So take it away. Awesome, thank you. Uh, is it possible to share a screen? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you should be able to, to do that. Uh, it's still gray. Okay. I'll, I'll make you the host. Okay. And uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm sorry. It's kind of under these circumstances. But as Chris points out, um, kind of two different places at once. So um, I have some slides and hopefully I'll be able to share them with you here in a second. Okay. Uh, I think we're almost there. Can everybody see my uh, presentation? Uh, I think it's going to take uh, just one more second, probably. Yeah, okay. here we go. Here we go. Okay, awesome. Well, again, um, thanks for being here. It's an honor to speak to you guys. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Chris. And as Chris points out, I'm actually a fellow New York State, uh, New York Stater. I don't know. I don't know what the technical term is, but um, my family's originally from Amsterdam, New York. I grew up in Greece, just outside of Rochester. Um, spent most of my childhood and, and high school years of getting around the Adirondacks and Finger Lakes. Um, spent a lot of time doing Boy Scout activities. 
uh, graduated from SUNY Geneseo, as, as Chris uh, pointed out. I think it's the, uh, what is it, the Hudson on the Genesee, I think is what they call it now. And I actually worked for New York State as an intern for about a year. For, for my senior year, I had an internship with the uh, DEC there in Avon. So obviously, New York State's actually really, really close to my heart. Um, go back all the time. Um, really enjoy being there. And uh, so it's, it's really a pleasure to talk to you guys. Hey, Tony, um, if, uh, Tony, if I can just cut in one second, uh, your screen's a little bit cut off. So maybe you can um, maybe make it a little bit smaller. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I see that green line you guys are seeing. Yeah. You see the slides now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like we're in uh, PowerPoint. And uh, yeah, maybe you can just do like uh, view full screen. Okay. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Awesome. It's a, uh, it's a technology. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the GIS certification Institute. And if you do have any questions, please, please shout them out or send them via text. Um, the GISCI has been around for a number of years. Um, basically began conceptually in the nineties, uh, became an official organization in 2003. Um, and started offering the GISP certifications. And then in 2015, uh, we changed our uh, program a little bit and we started offering certifications via the examination process. The GISCI is a not-for-profit organization. Um, so, so we are actual an institution um, and we are the only uh, organization right now that provides the GIS community with a complete certification. There's a couple other certifications I'll tell you about in a second, but ours is Ours is the broadest and the most complete. Um, it is, um, we are based in the United States of America, but we do have GISPs worldwide. Uh, we have GISPs on every continent except Antarctica, and we may have some working there. We don't have anybody with a physical address down in Antarctica yet. We're working on it, but um, we do have GISPs. I think it's, we're up to about 70 countries now and um, all over the globe. It really, uh, began out of that conversation that folks were having in the late 90s about trying to bring a professional certification to our society. Um, most of those folks were URISA, and indeed that's kind of where the ISP got started, was in URISA. Um, and they did a survey and the overwhelming response from our community was to, to move forward with the professional certification. So right now, uh, GISCI has four member organizations, NISGIC, National States Geographic Information Council. Um, and I'm actually here with uh, Frank um, Frank Winters, uh, who is your GIO, and, and Bill Johnson, former GIO of New York State. Um, both were, were either presidents or actually now past presidents in this district, like myself, uh, BURISA, UCGIS, and AAG. We've had other organizations over the years, most recently GEDA. Unfortunately, GEDA folded, and so um, now we're just down to four. Um, in terms of governance, you know, one of our biggest strengths has been the big and diversified community that we represent. Um, and that's what our board members do. They, they really do uh, represent the different sectors of the geospatial profession. Um, each of our organizations nominates two members to serve. Um, and then I, as the executive director, work at the discretion of the board. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the certification process. Um, professional certification is really nothing more than a way that a person can uh, exhibit the behaviors, the knowledge and the experience in a specific profession to a measured level. And so certification is not something unique to the GISCI or the geospatial industry. We know there's over 16,000 certifications alone in the United States. And, and really it's from a process in which an idea evolves into a technology, which evolves into an industry and which evolves into a profession. And so really, that's kind of where we are is we've, we've gone from a uh, geospatial industry to a geospatial profession. And now the next logical step is that certification and then continued industry growth. Certification is a demonstrated commitment to behaviors that enrich the profession. It is a commitment to growing and continuing to grow your professional skills beyond initial certification. It is a way to differentiate yourself from other professionals. Uh, GISP designation is difficult to get, and as such, uh, you should wear that with a high sense of honor because it does set you apart. It helps establish professional credibility, 
and it does indeed uh, potentially increase your earning professional, uh, potential. We found that about 60% of GISPs uh, make higher than average salaries. Um, so it's, it's not every instance, but in many instances, it leads to better pay. Like I said, there's about 1,600 different types of certifications across the, uh, the United States. There's obviously certifications outside the United States as well. We find that about 17% of our workforce hold some type of certification relationship. So it's, again, it's a relatively common uh, occurrence. And within the geospatial profession, we know four different types of certification. One is the ESRI technical certification, and it's unique uh, compared to the other three in that it's a uh, certification specific to an ArcGIS uh, product. So it's, it's specific to the software um, and, and all that surrounds it. Uh, the other three, which are, are obviously much broader, is the ASPRS remote sensing uh, slash photogrammetrist certifications, the U.S. Uh, Geospatial Intelligence Foundation GEOINT, which is Geospatial Intelligence Certification, and of course the GISCs, GISP, the Broad Geospatial Professional Certification. So we often have folks ask us, what's the difference between certification and licensure? Um, many of you may have certifications and or may have licensures. Certification is, is an official document that proves you have obtained a certain level of uh, achievement or knowledge that qualifies you for your line of work. And so certification is really just a way of measuring your skills and abilities towards those standards in the profession. Whereas licensure is proof that you are licensed to work in your profession. And so the biggest difference is licensure is actually a legal de uh, designation. Um, and it has a very clearly de set, uh, uh, set of, of defined requirements for that vocation. And so you know, the, one of the best examples I can provide to you related to our industry is survey and, and engineering. Those are licensed professions. And usually the licensure comes through a state board. Um, perhaps many of you are familiar with uh, friends that are involved in emergency medical services or firefighting. Um, and so in the state of Missouri, I'm actually a licensed EMT. So my licensure comes from the State Bureau of EMS. Um, now licensure and certification can be different across industries or across states. Uh, a second licensure that I have is I am a certified licensed pyrotechnician in the state of Missouri. That means I can do what's, what are called display fireworks. So the big fireworks you see at Ferris festivals and 4th of July celebrations, that's what we do. And in the state of Missouri, I'm required to have that licensure. I just spoke to Florida last week. State of Florida does not require licensure for pyrotechnicians. I can, I can go down there and shoot a show. I'm sure there's legal liabilities associated with uh, uh, potential damages and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the, their licensure is different. Um, certification for us applies worldwide. Your certification is good wherever you are because it's granted through the GISCI. The GIS program has been uh, growing since its inception in 2003. Um, to date, we have over 10,500 uh, GIS professionals. Not all are active. Some have retired or, or some have not maintained their designation. And so we have about 6,500 active GISPs. We receive a significant amount of interest. We have over 200 new websites registrations a month. Um, so the number of folks uh, that are registered and have applied in our program uh, vastly exceeds 10,500, but, but that uh, 10,000 number represents the number of folks that have successfully become GISPs. Since we began offering our exam, we've, we've been tracking some of our demographics. What we find is that about 50% of all the folks that uh, sign up for the exam are from the private sector. Uh, so different types of consulting firms. We know that some of our biggest partners are indeed consulting companies that require their employees to either have a GISP when hired or to get the GISP within a certain amount of time. Um, and so the private sector has definitely embraced this certification. Next group is government, all levels of government, about 35% of our folks come from government. What we find is the majority of these folks are state and county and local governments. We don't see a lot of federal uh, GISPs, that's not to say that there's not, but we do, um, we do primarily see folks in the local government sectors. And then academia and our other groups make up about the remaining 15% of GISPs. So what is the process to become a GISP? 
there's, there's two components to being a GISP. One is the initial certification, and then the second is recertification. And so to become a, a, a GISP, you have to do a couple things. And these can be done concurrently or sequentially. Uh, it's however you want to do it. The, the first thing that all GISPs have to do, whether they're uh, becoming a GISP for the first time or recertifying, is to sign an ethics statement. And that's the basis of our certification, is our ethics. So that's obviously very, very important to us. The second piece is to um, actually apply to become a GISP professional. And then when you do that, you have two components. One is to fill out a portfolio, and the second is to take and pass the exam. The portfolio is basically your resume and includes experience in the four, uh, following three categories. One is education, two is actual professional experience, and then three are contributions back to the profession. And what we ask each GIS uh, prospective GISP to do is to fill in and meet a point requirement in those three disciplines. It's typically not very difficult for folks to do. If you're active in the GISP community, you're participating in events like this, it's very easy to accumulate those points. Um, the real challenge is the exam. The GISP is also uh, uh, starts at somebody with four years of professional experience in the geospatial field. Uh, the test, as I'm going to talk about here in a few slides, is actually written to that standard. It assumes that you have experience in the field. However, anybody can take the exam at any point in their profession, as can they fill out the portfolio. Um, so these, these are the two biggest elements in, in addition to the ethics statement. Once you pass the GISCI Geospatial Core Technical Knowledge Exam and you've done all the other requirements, you become a GISP for a three-year period. At the end of three years, you have to recertify. When you recertify, it's a portfolio only. So what we're doing is, again, we're asking you to tell us about your contributions to the profession, your additional education that you've completed, and experience will also count towards recertification, but is it required? Really what we're looking at is that continued commitment to the profession in the form of um, education and contributions back. There are some small costs associated with becoming a GISP. Uh, each GISP, when they initially apply, has to pay a $100 one-time fee. They also have to pay a portfolio fee of $100 and then an exam of $250 or 300 if it's taken at an international test site. The first two fees, the application portfolio are one-time fees only. Nobody fails their portfolio. If you don't meet the requirements of the portfolio, we're just gonna tell you where you've come up short and give you some advice and allow you to get those points. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to make money off of this venture, we're just trying to cover our costs. So these, these are both one-time fees. The exam fee is a one-time fee if you pass it. Um, if you do not pass it and you choose to take the exam again, then you would just pay that $250 or $300 fee. You're not required to do the application portfolio. Once you apply for the GISP pro uh, process, uh, your portfolio is good for six years. Um, at the end of six years, quite frankly, I don't know what we do because we've never had anybody take six years to get it. Um, likely, we would work with you if you wanted to continue to keep the portfolio active. But like I said, everybody typically gets their GISP within about a, a one to three year period at most. Um, with your initial fees, you get one year of maintenance. Um, and then after that, you have to pay $95 a year as a maintenance fee associated with maintaining your GISP. And so um, basically a three, -year, a three year cycle costs $285, or if you want, you can pay it $95 at a time. So the, the big piece of the puzzle really is the exam, and that is the challenging piece for most folks. We offer an exam as part of our certification because it brings everybody to the same measurable competency level. In the old days, we had the portfolio um, application process. That's how I got my GISP because that was what was available to me at the time. It was a very rigorous process, but it didn't really measure that competency level. And that's what the exam is. It also provides additional visibility for the GIS professional certification. So it helps lead credence to this process and, and gives it much more validity, uh, validity in the professional world. Um, it does build upon the established GISP portfolio. So you still have to do that. Um, however, we've added the exam as an additional piece. Um, it also provides participations for student and early professionals. 
and it basically allows us to continue to advance and consolidate the profession. The exam is offered in um, twice a year currently. It, it might be offered more in the future, but we offer it twice a year in June and December. Um, we have eight days of testing that's available at any of the worldwide sites that our, our partner PSI offers. Um, the exam can be taken at any point in your career. So you can take it right out of college if you want to do that, um, or you could take it you know, 20, 30 years in. I believe what we found recently in the last few years is that most folks have uh, between four and nine years of experience that take our exam. So it's, it's folks that have been in the field for a few years, but you don't see a lot of old timers like myself taking the exam. Um, the exam itself has been, is written by GISPs for GISP certification. So it's basically written by folks from our community. We write the exam to all the national accreditation standards in the testing industry. And so we're basically doing what all standardized tests do when it comes to test design and, and preparation and uh, execution. And so if you've ever sat in on an ACT or SAT exam, it's a similar idea and it's a similar process in which we do that. The exam is, is derived from a blueprint. That blueprint is revised every three to four years. And the blueprint is what guides the exam process. It tells us where we're gonna pull our questions from. And current under the current blueprint, which is good for at least another two cycles, um, we have 45 different knowledge, skills, and ability uh, areas. And they are broken down into 10 different content areas, which I'm gonna talk about next. So how did we come up with these knowledge exam areas? Um, all of this has been started within the GISP community. It's based on a com uh, combination of job analysis, focus groups, um, and, and, and different processes to ensure that we have the broad geospatial community uh, represented. Um, it's based in part on the GIS and T body of knowledge, which is a commonly used document in, the, uh, in academia. Um, and that actually, I believe, has over 400 knowledge areas. Um, and basically what we did when we did our analysis is we found um, that about 10% of total GIS knowledge areas are relevant to a GIS professional across the range of the GIS um, certified professionals. So it is a very broad exam for that reason. And like I said, we have those 45 knowledge areas in the current exam. We, the blueprint guides how many questions are, are taken from each one of these sections. And so this is what the break, uh, breakdown of the exam looks like. 10% of our questions come from conceptual foundations. Everybody hopefully understands and knows conceptual foundations backwards and forward. But as you move through those lists, that list, you can see we look at fundamentals, cartography, visualization, data analysis, manipulation, and the like, and so on and so on. And, and when we break these down, we can see these different knowledge areas. We make all of this available to GISPs on our GISP website. The only thing that is a secret in our exam is the questions themselves and the answers. We provide the blueprint. We tell folks where these questions are coming from so that that can be used to guide you when you study. If you want to know if it's on the exam, look at the blueprint and it will tell you if that particular subject area is going to be represented. And the reason why we're constantly updating this blueprint is our, our field is constantly changing. When this exam was written, there was not a strong emphasis on uh, UAS or drone technologies, there was different types of programming. And so when we uh, update the exam, we're bringing in those new fields to help make it relevant. The exam itself is taken at any of our official testing centers. Um, and you can see the list of testing centers online and our website. It consists of 180, I'm sorry, 180 total questions, 100 of which are scored, and 80 of which are not scored. Those unscored questions, again, very typical for an exam, are designed to allow us to build a test bank. Every test that we offer is different for each test period. So if you take the test this December, you'll take the same test as everybody else during that testing period, but that test itself is unique to that testing period. Our next testing period will have a completely different exam. Some of the questions will likely be the same, but essentially what we do is we have a large number of questions. We pull those hundred scored questions from the bank to create the exam. And then we add new questions in to test them out. The reason we do that, sometimes our questions are too hard. 
So we don't want to uh, ask those on an exam. And sometimes they're too easy. And we also don't want to do that on, on an exam. The, the additional questions allows us to evaluate and determine the validity of the questions themselves for the pool. Um, when you take the exam, you have to wait one month to get your results. I know folks don't like that and I don't blame them. And here's the reason why. Uh, this exam is actually scored three separate times. And we do that to ensure that all of the results are 100% accurate. Everything is done on computers. The exam itself is loaded into computers and testing centers across the world by a variety of different people. They can make mistakes. The uh, answer keys also loaded in the same way. People can make mistakes and they often do. And so we take an entire month for basically four weeks to score the exam three separate times. We run what's called psychometric analysis, look for any anomalies or errors in the data or the questions themselves. And we actually look at the reviews of each one of the exams, again, to make sure nothing went wrong. For the amount of money and time that people put in preparing for the exam, we don't want somebody to fail simply because the answer key was loaded wrong or we had a number of questions that didn't have the right answers or had graphics they couldn't see in the exam. All of these things have happened to us and because of our rigorous process, we've been able to recover every time and provide folks with the right answers um, and the right results. Okay, my slide does not want to advance. So to prepare for the exam, there is no single way or single method that we recommend for the exam. There are a lot of resources out there available to you. Um, we give you the blueprint, we give you some suggestions, but we, we basically allow each person to come up with their own way of studying for the exams. The best thing we tell folks to do is to look at the blueprint, know the blueprint, follow the blueprint, come up with your own strategy, uh, consider taking the official practice exam, uh, which is actually not new this fall, it was new last fall, and I keep forgetting to change that slide. Um, but you can take a practice exam. It's an online exam that consists of a smaller group of questions uh, that are scored. You do get that score immediately, and you can take it twice for a $30 fee. And so essentially what, you, what we recommend is you take the exam, get the results, um, learn, you know, understand which areas you didn't do so well in, use it as a guide to do some additional studying, and then take the exam a second time and see if you picked up the knowledge and the skills. It's a, it's a really good way to help you prepare for the exam and move forward. Um, and so just real quick and wrapping up future directions for GISCI. Um, again, like I said, we're talking about updating that blueprint. Um, really, my role as the new executive director is to start expanding our footprint within the geospatial community, both locally and internationally. Uh, we're modifying our bylaws to bring more representation on the board. Um, and we're also bringing more, represent, uh, more representation into the test generation process. And we're beginning the uh, analysis for creating an entry level exam for prospective GISPs graduating from college. Um, so again, a lot of areas of growth. Um, and so just some closing thoughts. Uh, a survey was done by my organization, NISGIC, and one of the members response to what they thought of GISP was, that they would rather spend their money on beverages than they would the certification. And I think that's very short-sighted. I think most folks that don't like or don't agree with the GISP just don't understand it. And so really what we try to do is make sure people are knowledgeable before making their uh, judgment. But what I would tell you is that if you wanna become a GISP, it takes a long-term investment. You do have to study, you do have to get the contributions and the experience to become a GISP. Then you have to continue to do those things to maintain your certification. That's the whole point of the certification. It's something that basically sets you apart from other people in your profession. It's, it, it is a designation that says, it's, I am more than just somebody who shows up to work, does the job, and goes home. It shows that you're dedicated to the community. And as most folks know, if you go to a conference, they typically have free beer. So you don't need to save your money for beer. Save it on that certification. And so with that, I'd like to just close out from a quote, uh, with a quote from Bill Johnson, fellow New Yorker. Um, Carpe Geo Evangelist now working for AppGeo. And, and when he was asked his opinion of the, of the GISCI, he, he said, you know, initially he had his reservations and, and didn't really see a great value. He said, but as he grew to understand what it was, 
he saw the GISP as something critical to our community. And, and one of the reasons he gave a couple, but one of the reasons he gave is that he said it reinforces behaviors that enrich the profession. And I can't think of a better way of saying the importance of the GISCI. And so that's why I have that quote there. And I think I'm probably past my 30 minutes. I apologize, but at this point, that should be my last slide. So I'll take questions. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. That was uh, uh, a very thorough um, review of the process. And uh, I think a lot of folks had questions about that. So it was right on. Uh, people ask me frequently about, you know, how do I get about, how do I get into doing the GISP certification? So that was, that was very spot on. So thank you. Uh, we have, we have a question here uh, that says uh, in the chat, it's uh, from Catherine. And she says, do you have a ballpark figure of how many folks take the exam each cycle and uh, the pass rate? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, we expect 500 in December, and the pass rate is about 62%. It's been going up. And I think it's because people are preparing themselves more for the exam and they understand the exam better. Uh, so, we're really hoping we, we, every year we see that rate go up. But 62 was the last exam, was the last two exams were 62% pass rate. Right. Right. Yeah, that's very encouraging. <laughs> yeah. People are concerned, it, right? The, the exam is a tough exam, it's supposed to be a tough exam. But we give everybody a blueprint and the resources to study. And, and, and if you study and you put an effort, you're going to pass it usually, if not on the first, the second time. It's rare that people take three, four, five times to pass the exam. Yeah, not, you know, I totally agree. You know, it's one of those things that if, if it was easy, then it wouldn't have any value, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's, you know, a uh, challenging effort, then you, people know that it's worth worthwhile. Uh, one other thing, uh, Tony, that, that you're working on is the... Is the um, the uh, status for people that are going into retirement. You know, I think I think folks might be interested in that. Uh, I think to share like real quick. Yeah. So so we're actually working on a couple of additional certifications. Uh, the one that Chris references is a retirement certification, and um, hopefully, you know, we plan on having that approved here in the next month or two, and then hopefully rolled out shortly after. Uh, and it's uh, it's not uncommon in certification programs, folks retire, but they want to maintain that title. And so we intend to offer retired title for our GISPs. There'll be some criteria, um, mainly that you've been a GISP for a number of years. Um, and there'll be a very small fee associated with maintaining that. Uh, but it's an idea that will allow folks to continue to put that uh, designation after their name. We're also looking at uh, potential certification in data analysis field. Um, that's something we're going to work with another organization on. And um, we're also looking at uh, designated employers that are friendly to GISPs. And one thing I didn't bring up, for some folks, and a lot of folks actually, the costs can be prohibitive or difficult. I encourage everybody to always ask their employer. I, I never knew my employer would pay for my certification until I asked. And they're like, oh, absolutely. And indeed, a lot of, a lot of employers will pay. Um, and usually what we find is they'll pay for everything in one exam. If you fail the exam, uh, a lot of employers either won't pay for a second or they may not pay for the first, which I think is very fair. Um, but a lot of employers do that. And then most of our folks or a fair number will see an increase in salary after they've completed the process. Excellent. Excellent. Um, got a quick question here and then uh, we'll wrap it up uh, after this. Uh, there's a question about from Rachel, if there's any grants out there that might um, help with the cost of certification. Not yet, but we're working on that. And we hope okay. to have something set up in the next few months for that. Great. Yeah, great, great question, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Well, Tony, thanks so much. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, you know, when uh, Tony and I were chatting, he, he uh, wished that we were going to have an in-person event, you know, under the right conditions. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, to see you next year. I hope so. I love I love New York any time of year, but it's it was 100 degrees in Dallas yesterday. And it really made me wish we were in upstate New York. And, <laughs> yeah. on a day well, the weather's today. perfect right now. You know, it's uh, fall, fall, perfect weather. So, yeah. All right. right. Well, you. you guys enjoy your day and enjoy your conference. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. I hope to see you in the future. All right. Thanks so much, Tony. Appreciate right. it. You guys take care. Thank you. Bye. Okay, everybody, uh, we have uh, another um, presentation here and then we'll take a break. Um, it's always a good idea to take a break. And so our next speaker uh, is going to be David Craker. 
And I'll bring in David. And David should be coming in. And then when David is in, I will make him our host. And here's David. So David, uh, welcome, welcome to our, our meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, I got you. Wait a minute, let me. So you should be able to share your screen now when, when you're ready. I, I don't I don't want to have a uh, hold on. Yeah, that's okay. Take take your time. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna hang up. I was using the phone. Oh, hold okay. on. All right, perfect. All right, Chris, can you hear me? Yep, and I got you. Yep, uh, we got you. This is what I'm gonna do. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's all good. No rush. Yeah, no rush. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to use the um AirPods because they're building a building next door to me. And it would... <laughs> right. But, uh, all right. It's the pearls of working at home. It is. Okay. So let me go ahead. I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to try. You need me to be off by maybe. Oh, wait. Well, yeah. We can go over a little bit. So take okay. your time and, and do your, do your, I want to give you I'm... your full, full time. So. So yeah. uh, just before we get started, I want to introduce uh, David. David is an uh, uh, education outreach specialist with uh, U.S. Census Bureau uh, out of the New York City office. And I'm um, very looking forward to hearing about the latest and greatest of the, the, the 2020 data. Probably everyone's heard that the um, data was going to drop on us. I think we received something on Monday and uh, I think more to come. And um, I don't want to give it all away. I, I wanted to share that the GIS SIG group out of Rochester is having David as a keynote speaker. Uh, so if you, everyone should tune in for that. But uh, David's just going to give us a short overview of um, what's happening with the census uh, for everybody here in the state. So David, take it away. Okay, sure. I'm going to go through my little slide presentation really, really quick, and then I'll go right onto the website and show how to get the data. Okay. Um, but I really just felt like I needed to elaborate just a little bit. Uh, for anybody who didn't know, we just, you know, we finished that decennial census over uh, a year ago. It's taken us quite a while to, you know, put all the numbers together. Um, but we do visit uh, every, in theory, we visit every household. Um, we go to e every place in the country, every block, every uh, block group, every tract, and we, we get the, the information. We only ask 10 questions. Um, the important thing right here is to note the very last bullet point uh, that the data is available at the block level. Okay, this is the only census uh, where we do uh, put out the data at the block level. Um, as opposed to this, the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing survey, uh, it is uh, a sample survey, but we do ask 72 questions. And so this is where you would look for uh, that deep demographic data if you wanted that. Um, so I put both of these in here, sort of a juxtaposition so that you keep in your mind that we actually have two censuses that go on. We have that 10-year census, uh, and the numbers just came out, the other, uh, sort of in a hard to grasp area back in August and last week they came out in an easier place to get. Um, and, and what actually came out was f actually for redistricting, but they are the basic numbers and next spring we will actually parse that out even more um, and release actually more data at that time. But um, actually not more data, the same data, but it's, it's parsed out differently. And then we're also releasing all the time every December, you can get uh, the American Community Survey data as well. So I just want you to keep in mind that there are two things. Um, I'm showing this a little geographic hierarchy up here, and this is what I sort of show people uh, to get them going in our system. So notice this central spine, we like to say the Census Bureau that this is how things nest, the blocks nest within a block group. They nest within a tract and they nest within a county. They don't nest within a town or a township or anything like that. 
um, and then they nest within the state and then the nation, right? And then all these other things sort of nest either within a county or a state, if you're looking at that. One nice thing for New York State um, residents or GIS people is that uh, most county subdivisions, meaning towns in New York State, um, they do actually con contain the tracks, okay? The tracks nest within those. Doesn't happen in, in most states, so, but it does happen in New York State most of the time, okay? Um, so today I'm going to take you into data.census.gov. We don't, that's what we call it. Um, and I always like to say the secret to getting into that is actually beginning here. And that's under where it says advanced search. And advanced search isn't really for people who are advanced. It's it's just a an easier way to look for data and you would click on it and it would open something like this and it would allow you to start parsing things out and sorting things by year or geography or whether you want a decennial or you want an American community survey. And so um, let me just go, that's me again, who I am. Let me escape here and I'm going to do something here. I'm going to switch a new share and let's go here. Okay, can you, somebody let me know, you can see my screen, it says explore census data. Yeah, looks great, David. Okay, all right, good. So once again, I like to say the secret is actually coming to advanced search. You click on that, it shows you this little screen here. And I'm going to show you how to get decennial data, uh, what just came out last week first, and then maybe some ACS, but really this is what everybody's looking for. I always say you need to come to the year first and, and let it know what year you want. So the 2020 data, those hard numbers are right here. You check on 2020 and um, then you probably want to come to what it says survey. And the only thing available for 2020 is the decennial census. So you click on that. And then the only thing available here is the redistricting data. Okay, so you click on that. Um, and it knows intuitive, intuitively what is available, what isn't available as you click on things, all right? So we could look for data by track level, by block group, by block, whatever we want. It's Most of it is here. Um, but I did think it would be, uh, you know, kind of interesting to um, maybe look by block. But let me just show you really quickly. We will look for what we call a county subdivision, and that would be a city or a town in uh, New York State. So I will come here. So I'm sort of going through my nesting operation. So I know I need New York State. And then I need to know the county. So I'm going to go to Auburn. And I'll say Cuga County. And I'm going to go here. And I could take everything in the county, all the county subdivisions, but I will take Auburn City. And then all you have to do is once this little thing up, there's a little thing up here that kept going across, go to the right, say search. And it gives you the tables that are now available. There should be six of them. Okay, you're going to get race, occupancy status, Hispanic, race by population, Hispanic or Latino and group order. Okay, so I will just click on one of them, race right here. And it will give me a table and you can download that table if you wanted to. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. It gives you those hard numbers, all right? Occupancy status, it might be a small table, but it tells you how many are occupied, how many are vacant. And then if you happen to have, these are other things that are here. The group quarters, uh, I find kind of interesting because you can actually figure out, you know, how many students you have living on a college campus or correctional facilities, that sort of thing. So this is, what you would do um, with this, right? Um, and then what you can also do is actually come here to customize table. And if you wanted to, you can download the table um, or you can go back and over here, you can also on the left, there's a download button and you can click on all of these and you can download all of them together if you wanted to, here we go. So if you want to click, if you want to download everything at one time, you can just start right here and download selected, and then you're going to just download right there. Okay, but let me go back. And the way to go back and clear everything out is to click on our logo right up here at the upper left. And so I do that I come back to advanced search. And I find um, it's more interesting, actually, if I go straight to uh, census blocks, right? So I'm going to go once again to the year, 
2020 and the survey and I say decennial. And then I come over here and I say redistricting data, public law 94-171. And then I come back to geography over here on the left. And I'm going to select block. And so this is where you kind of have to know um, what it nests within. So you have to know the census tract, okay? Well, lucky for us, I looked up the census tract for Auburn City beforehand. So here we have New York State, and we know that it's Cuga County. And then over here, we have all the blocks in Cuga County. You could certainly go that route if you wanted to, but I'm actually going to just say, say I want census tract 403, all the blocks in 403, and I may take this other um, tract as well, 404, all the bla uh, blocks in 404. So those are two tracks within the city of Auburn. And then I can come down here and I can say search. Okay, and it's letting me know what is available right there, right? And I always like to sort of, I can come up to table if I wanted to and look at the table. I can download all these tables if I wanted to go that route. Um, or I can customize the table and I can fool around with it a little bit if I wanted to. And if I want to just save this, let's say I'm working on this and I was looking at occupancy status and I got called away from my work. Up here, you have a URL at the top. If you click on the URL, right click it, copy it and paste it, put it somewhere in an email. And tomorrow you click on it, it will bring you back here. Okay. And from here, you can back up whatever you need to do. You can add to it. You can take away from it. It, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but it gets you in here a lot quicker if you want to go that route. But I do want to show you this. There is a mapping functional function in here. You click on the map and it will begin mapping um, the first variable that was in that uh, table. Now, usually it will go straight um, to uh, what you've selected, but um, it's having a bad day today. I tested this out beforehand. It goes to the center of the country. So you just kind of have to know the center of the country is in Kansas. And then you come up this way and you sort of have to know visually where you are, right? And so we know we're up here somewhere. Let me find it, Portland. Okay, all right, fine. Here we go. I may have selected the wrong, wrong thing. It should come up. I think I selected two, uh, the wrong, um, Sorry about that, 403 and 404. It, anyway, it's good for showing. So we're up here at the very north of the county. I meant to get something else, but I got this. And it's showing us all the blocks in those two uh, census tracts, right? And it's mapping them for us. But what, and it ha even has a legend over here on the left. But what is it mapping? It's actually just mapping, I believe, if we looked up here, um, occupied or vacant, right? Um, now we can switch things up here that are in the table by occupied or vacant. If I wanted to look at vacant, you know, we could do that. If we want to go back to the table, right, and switch a table, we can come here, right? Want go back one more to the tables. Here it is. And maybe I wanted something different. So maybe I wanted race. Okay, it will change the table for me. It has a lot more information, right? I can come back to customize table and to the map. Oh, I'm sorry. It is it's having a really bad day today. I thought it would come right back to the map. So it's good for you to see that things go wrong for me so that when you are looking at this and things go wrong for you, you know it's not just you. It, it's just, uh, it just happens sometimes, right? Uh, so here we go. Let's let's go in here. So we were the north of Cougar County up here. Okay. Okay. And so we have this, right? But we can actually come up here to the, the left where it says total. And we have the different options that we can take. So if you don't feel like pulling this into your GIS and you feel like you, you actually want to look at this a little bit before you pull it in. So we could do something like this, maybe American Indian or Asian or African American. I will, I will select that. And it will sort of sort it out for you over here. 
and it's giving you hard numbers, not too many um, people who are African-American in that area. So we can come back here and we could perhaps select American Indian, let's see if we get anything different. Not too much, okay, so, but whatever, you can certainly do this before you pull it into um, your GIS, okay? You can kind of take a look at it. Maybe it's of no value to you and it's good to see it before you pull it in, but it will map things for you. If you need to change things from block to maybe census tract, you can do it right here actually, and it will keep the same variable. So let's see if we can find that. Census tract, you have tribal tract. Oh, there it is down there. Okay. And we actually, by the way, you can select things. There's a little button up here on the left. If you want to use the map to select things, you can use that if you wanted to. And I will move around and I'll select this. Okay, and it starts selecting things. So you can actually use the map and a select tool if you want to build something. Maybe you don't know what blocks are in within your city or you don't know what tracks are within your city. Here's Auburn right here. Let me just move down. Notice you have to sort of toggle back and forth between select and, and the, the, uh, move, the panning uh, functionality. So here is Auburn. Okay, so we have all that in, the tracks that are in Auburn, then to the, the northeast of Auburn, and we were looking at races. Um, and so we could select something like this and see if we get a different looking map, and we do. Okay, so that is something you can do with this. You can actually sort just pull the data in if you want to. Um, certainly, you need to, you're going to have to, you know, get the census shape files to match those up. Um, the data with that. But this is um, something you can do before you actually pull it into your GIS. You can pull, fool around with it. If you really want to fool around a little bit more, there's a little gear key over here on the left. And you could say, I don't like natural breaks. I want, you know, maybe equal interval. And maybe I can't see this coloration. And so you pull it down here and you say, I, I need, I like red or something like that. And you can change the way it looks. You can save your URL up here at the top. You can right click on that and copy and paste it. And it will save that you know map for you. So that's that's something you can do. This is the um, the latest and greatest 2020 data. Um, I clicked on the icon there one more time. The logo. I've got a couple more minutes, and just really quickly, I do want to show you years 2018. So that's the last time ACS data came out until December, right? And so we may come here. We could do uh, geographies or surveys, whichever way you want to go. I'll take American Community Survey. I want the five-year data. That means it's an average over five years. Data profile, I know I want that. And notice it throws these chips down here. What we Those are your search chips, we call them, um, just so you have a visual of what you, what you chose, right? So I'm going to go to geography, and I'm going to say maybe um, county, and we're going to take all counties in New York State Here we go, all counties. Okay, and I'm going to say search. And so I did choose data profile and data profile is sort of like what I call the Walmart of tables coming from ACS and it has a lot of data. And look at this, when I click on this, you want to see what one of these, um, what these look like. So this has all sorts of things. It's for every county. It's, you know, people are people married, you know, um, who's making the money. Um, fertility rates, believe it or not, grandparents, school enrollment, and educational attainment, veteran status, on and on and on. And I do like data profile tables because they give you percentages, right? So sometimes if you were just going to hard numbers, New York City would really skewer everything, right? But data profile, you're lucky enough you can you can get these percentages, right? So that's kind of a, a nice thing that's there. So let's just say we wanted to look for something that um, I think we saw uh, veterans down here. This is the last thing of veterans, and we're looking for the percentage of the total, right? It's over here. So I'm going to go to map. It will just automatically map for you. Right, but you can come up here and you can change what's being mapped right here, the estimate, and you could come down and it, you'll either get an estimate or um, a percentage. 
And let's see if we can find that veteran. Somewhere way down here, I, cho I chose the wrong one again, right? Here we go, veteran status, civilian population over. So I want the percentage. And that way it sort of, you know, even, helps even out a little bit. New York, not not in this case, I guess, but um, in, in general, you know, it, it does help a little bit. So you can kind of see what's going on in a state where you have more of one thing or, or less of something. Um, so it is just functionality here in the map. If you, by the way, I think sometimes if you wanted to deselect, let's say you didn't want Long Island, I think, let's see that. Yeah, you can actually deselect certain counties as well if you if you didn't want them. So that's just something you can do and it, it will change the way your map looks. Um, okay, so uh, Chris, that's my little demonstration. Um, and I, I don't know, do we have any questions? I don't mind taking questions. All right, awesome, David. Thanks so much. What a, what an awesome demo in in uh, just fifteen minutes. I mean, you showed a lot of. Uh, things that we can do with that. Uh, you know, I had a quick question is, is, is this seems like a real vast improvement on uh, what we were using previously. And how do, how do they come about uh, making this improved interface? Was that was that um, something that they did, got got feedback on, and then they, they sort of like refined the method? So, so Chris, the, the previous, um, the previous, the previous, uh, I don't know what I call it, American Fact Finder was yeah. much loved. <laughs> but the mapping functionality was much loved by a lot of people. Maybe not the other stuff, but the- Yeah, 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 right. And when this first came out, um, this was not a hit. It was absolutely was not a hit, but we've got a lot of uh, uh, feedback. Yeah, that's a good word. Aggressive hate feedback <laughs> and every month make updates to this. And so it is, it is getting a lot better. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, and especially with this release of the 2020 data, they've made all sorts of improvements to it. Right. Yes. Little by little, it, it, we're getting there. Right on. Right on. Hey, David. One one other thing uh, that that had come up was there there's sort of a um, a greater split in in uh, the way that we carve people up into different demographic groups, uh, where we have like you have multiple options. You know, under your race category, you can have like multiple choices is that does that sound familiar is, is there more options of like splitting people into like smaller and smaller sort of uh, okay. subcategories we do have that in the american community survey okay, okay. We, it is not in as far as i know it is not in the the 2020 data or maybe though in the spring it will be but i have okay. a feeling it's only probably mostly going to be in the american community survey okay great gotcha gotcha right on right on and uh, uh, just checking the chat real quick. Uh, can you say a little bit about the redistricting process? Uh, I, gu I guess that was probably a, a calculated uh, data dump to put that data out there. Are, are states working on the redistricting process as we speak and, and making use of this data? Um, I, I think it was kind of like, yeah, we hit the button and everybody's running. <laughs> yeah, I, I think every and every state does it differently so we don't you know we we tell them you know what their um their numbers are going to be how many people you know the the range people can live within each uh, amount of people can live within a district and they will figure that out one thing that's very interesting maybe for people who do gis the the redistricting uh within the states you know congressional districts and assembly districts and all that um, it is based on uh, census blocks, right? So they can cobble together all those census blocks and figure out where they want their district to be. But this time around at the Census Bureau, we got rid of a lot of census blocks. So we used to, mm -hmm. every clover leaf in a highway and everything, every, mm -hmm. you know, every roundabout and things like that ended up being its own little block. And we've consolidated a lot of those. So there are a lot less uh, census blocks out there than than were their last uh, census. So the, it might be more challenging. Uh, maybe people won't be able to use uh, median strips along, you know, a highway to connect their congressional district. But you know, the, the we let states figure out what they want to do. Right, right on. 
Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question because, uh, as you know, New York is losing a congressional district. So we'll see how that uh, how's that works out. Uh, yeah, so we have a question from uh, Chris. Um, he's asking, are we able to download the data in a shapefile or geodatabase or some other sort of uh, spatial format to add in the GIS uh, directly? Uh, can you still, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I believe you can come over where it says uh, browse by topic. This is this is census.gov browse by topic geography. And as far as I know, this is the place where you're going to go looking for that the um, the geography stuff. So you're going to have some geodatabases here, cartographic boundary files if you wanted things sort of simplified. And then you're going to have your tiger uh, line file. So I believe it's in here. Um, we actually, just so you know, the, the shape files and here's here, they have it listed down here. Most of the shape files you put out there at the beginning of the year before the data is even released. So, but this is the place where you're going to go looking for that. Right on. Yeah, that, that's perfect. That looks like exactly what we're looking for there. Right, right on that page. Yeah. Pretty interesting. All right. Well, David. I think I think we uh, yeah so thank you you covered his question perfectly. Okay. So, right. And so so I'm yes I just talked I'm going to be at the the other the SIG GIS in November so many people might be there so I know don't give this presentation again right. <laughs> right right right. Um, but uh, yeah yeah thanks so much David for for joining us and um, yeah uh, yeah David's going to speak longer at, at the GIS SIG uh conference which is coming up uh, relatively soon uh in rochester and um we should all uh check that out and register if we're able so if i can do a regional plug uh while i'm at it and uh and david is also available to chat with people uh if you have time to put your email david if you want to like be available to other folks if they want to connect me, with you let me see if i can do that right now let me okay. uh share i just want to put this up here uh it might be at the very beginning oh yeah okay okay yeah, yeah perfect yep right exactly and I, I will say chris i just want to say um i got to put a plug in for myself this is what i actually do I'm, i go out and teach people how to get data i i cover new york state okay so under the normal circumstances i spend about one week a month doing a circuit and coming around and giving a class or helping people or whatever they need uh, right now, everything's virtual, but it is a free service. And, um, you know, we don't charge for anything. Okay. Great. Yeah. It's awesome. free. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, David, thanks so much. Uh, that was a great update. And I appreciate uh, giving you like such a great tutorial in a short amount of time. That was awesome. So okay. thank you. All thank right. you. And it's recorded, right? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we'll see you. See you in Rochester. Or okay. virtual, virtually as, as we speak, right? Okay. So, all, right. all right. Thanks Thank so much. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. I think... Uh